Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast of board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Chris. And this is Dave. And this is episode 446, Top 10 Games with Board Games for the Better. We like to thank all our Patreon backers, but especially Jill, who've upgraded, and our brand new Patreon backer, Jonathan. Thank you, my friends. You rock. All right, everyone, we are back with a brand new episode, and I'm so glad to have Chris and Game Master Dave back for another episode. Hi, guys. Hey. Hello. I'm, I'm so happy to be back myself. <laughs> yeah, you may remember Chris and Dave were on not too long ago when we were at the Long Island Big Gaming Convention, and we actually had Game Master Dave on his own episode. So for this episode, we'll be talking to Chris about board games for the better. Uh, Anthony's out this week. Anthony Will went to a big convention in Toronto. Uh, it was called Serious Board Games. Like, who knew? They were so serious. But there is <laughs> Serious Play Convention 2023. They went there. They did fantastic work talking about tabletop gaming. I think there were only one or two people out there talking about tabletop versus digital virtual. But they were there. They represented. Um, at some point, I believe, we'll have their presentation so that you could learn more about their perspective on tabletop gaming. But for now, we're going to let them rest a little bit. But Chris, we had you on way back when, but let's let people know about you and Board Games for the Better. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Chris. I started an organization called Board Games for the Better. Uh, it's a nonprofit where we give board games out to... Uh, children, families, and marginalized communities. Uh, we're hoping to use board games to foster positive social and mental engagement. Uh, last year, we gave out over 600 games to kids in foster care, kids in uh, long-term site care, uh, families dealing with domestic violence, uh, families who lost houses in wildfires, you name it. Like, If there was like a family in need, we were trying to get games to them. Um, yeah, so we've been doing this for about two years now. Um, and we've got a lot of events coming up. Uh, Dave's got an event coming up that we're going to be attending next week. And, um, Chris and I have a, an event on November 4th that we're going to be talking about later on. So, um, Chris, tell me like a little bit more about that experience. So you find a population underserved that's not getting games to the table for a number of different reasons. And... Like, have you done something recently about that? Like, what, what's what been going on? Like, what's some recent activity or event? Like, what's that kind of experience like for you and for your team? Also, uh, this past week, uh, we went to Corona, New York. Uh, there was a school that reached out to us. They just got a um, new program where they were able to help low-income families and refugees that were coming to New York. And what they were doing, they had a health fair at their school, and they wanted us to come to bring games for the kids. Uh, they were expecting about two to 300 kids that day. Uh, it was a pretty short notice. We were able to get about 100 games, and we had a few tables set up for them to play while they were there. And it was three hours of fun. Uh, 100 games were brought in. 100 games went to new homes. Uh, we had families that were coming to play uh, we had simple dexterity games just so they, they can kind of go in and out and switch as often as they wanted to. So we had Jenga, uh, we had Suspend, we had Clunk, and uh, we had uh, Taco Cat Goat Cheese Pizza, which was really fun <laughs> to have about uh, 10 to 15 kids at a time screaming at the top of their lungs, Taco Cat Goat Cheese Pizza. Um, <laughs> So it was it was great. It was an absolutely amazing experience. We got so many uh, families together to play games. Uh, we had the kids starting off, and then you know, like they were playing to spend. They rolled the dice to see what color they were gonna pull, and then sure. we would pass the dice on to the parents, and they was like, "No, no, like this is a game for kids." And then we we're like, "No, no, like you're here, like play, roll the dice, see how you feel." And you know, we got families really engaged with them. Uh, we nice. had a father and son who were trying to see how long they can go uh, in Jenga. And uh, when the tower fell, they asked us if we had a copy that we can give them. Sadly, we didn't have any at the time. So he looked this kid dead in the eyes and he was just like, we got to go. And the kid was like, why? What's going on? He's like, we need to go home, buy Jenga and play. 
and they <laughs> they left immediately. Like they just kind of got up, and they, the kid had this big smile, and the dad was like, "Oh my god, yes, we're gonna play Jenga." And like that's the kind of thing that we're looking for. We want to be able to bring like families, you know, to have these like fun experiences at home. Uh, a lot of times, families can't afford to go out and buy Jenga, so we want to be there to give them that opportunity. Wonderful, Chris. Yeah, I mean, it's such a a wonderful, important kind of practical, physical interrelationship kind of experience for families and for kids to feel empowered that they can do something, be successful in something on a a somewhat similar level to parents, especially when it comes to dexterity game. And also they could teach other people. They, They feel empowered by it. I mean, it's just what a wonderful thing that you that everyone does over there. Yeah. You know, at some at some of the uh, events that I do, uh, I try to get uh, families and kids to play Happy Salmon together. And the adults are like, no, 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 no. This is a kid's game. And I'm like, no. I'm like, no, you'll you'll see. You're going to have so much fun. Just jump right in. And uh, and they do. And it's, uh, you know, Chris, when you were telling your story about, you know, this most recent event, it really gave me the feel goods. You know, I was like, man, it's just so awesome. All three of us work towards getting families and exposure uh families together and exposure to board games and chris uh i'm super excited for you to uh, have started this nonprofit. i mean uh i i hope i can continue to support it as much as i can as well as my friends you know we're going to spread the word thank Excellent. you really appreciate that nice and again uh we have some big events again supporting getting more people to the table we've always kind of promote this message. The more people, the more diverse populations, the more people get to the table, more games that get to the table, you know, especially the games we like. It's, it's a little selfish, but obviously it's for the greater good. So, um, Chris, tell us a little bit about our upcoming event that we're doing and who we're doing it for. So we have the Tabletop Charity event coming up on November 4th in Fanwood, New Jersey. Uh, the big goal for this event is to try to include women into this hobby uh, by playing games, by going into designing, artists, however they want to include themselves into the hobby. We want to really be able to support them. Um, we're doing this by raising funds for Troop 6000. This is a Girl Scouts troop uh, that focuses on ki- uh, kids that are in uh, the shelter system and uh, also refugees that are coming in that have children that want to join. So these are sort of like the Girl Scout troops without a single location. They're spread throughout all five boroughs of New York City. Uh, And we really want to support them. We want to be able to give them an opportunity to see themselves in gaming, uh, to see that they have a space at the table with along with everybody else, whether it's at home or it's with other people. Um, We want to see we can kind of use these funds to give to them so they can support their programs, but also we want to see if we can build a gaming room for them. So in one of their locations, or maybe more, depending on how much we can raise, well, we want to give them a space where they can play games with each other, feel safe to play these games with each other, and, you know, really enjoy, like, everything we were just talking about, like, kind of bringing people together with gaming, like, we want to really be able to give them that. Absolutely. And... All the information can be found on BoardGamersAnonymous.com. Or, Chris, where can they find that on your website? Uh, so if you go to uh, board games, uh, <laughs> BoardGamesForTheBetter.org, uh, we have a page there where you can click to see what events we've got coming up, and uh, we'll have it posted there. Uh, yeah, if you also- can't make the event, there's still opportunities to donate through Chris's website and to support Chris and his organization, to support so many different groups out there to help them get great games to the table. So whether you can make donations for games or donations for money, Chris and his team are doing amazing things. Please support. It helps a lot. All of this information will also be in the show notes, so you can check out there. Dave? Yeah, I, I just want to say, also, um, I don't know when this episode's going to air, but October 21 and 22 at the Beth yes. Page Library, uh, Chris from Board Games for the Better and his wife are going to be there. And if you live locally in Long Island, and even if you just want to stop in the Beth Page Library for for two minutes, drop off one of those games that uh, that you have not been playing. It's been sitting on your shelf. Chris will put it to good use. Uh, but of course, if you want to, uh, you know, come play some uh, uh, Django with uh, Ginger or uh, some D and D or or another board game with me. So you know, so we're gonna have a great time at that uh, convention, and we're really hoping to get Chris uh, and his organization a bunch of games donated. So come on down. Yeah, Dave, you've been doing this for a very long time, bringing people to the table. You were former 
game store owner yourself and such a welcoming presence at the table, at the conventions. I know we've enjoyed meeting you, working with you directly. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the convention that's upcoming this weekend. So this will come out on Tuesday, so people will still have some time to come out. And where can they find your information and the upcoming convention? Oh, thanks so much. Uh, so uh, the convention is called Octacon. It's our 10th year that we've been doing it. We've been doing it at the Beth Page Library. It's our free little mini convention. We like to call it free, fun, and friendly. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my wife, Ginger, Game Master Ginger, will be there greeting you at the door. And uh, then I will be downstairs running a whole bunch of games. But we have some fantastic events. Now, I already mentioned, of course, if you got some games, bring them down there for uh, Chris at Board Games for the Better. But I've also, for those that live in the Long Island area, you might know David Miller. He's going to be running Thunder Road Mario Kart themed. And we got uh, uh, we got Chip Theory Games coming. We've got the Brooklyn Crokinole Club coming. We've got a representative from Steve Jackson Games coming. We've got Play to Win Games from Double Exposure. We've got Hit Point Demo Team. They've got a Kickstarter coming out. And we got role playing games and a ton of board games. 35 plus board games uh, on the schedule. And uh, that is, you can find that at GameMasterGames.com or you can go to GameMasterGames.com backslash Octacon, O-C-T-A-C-O-N. That will also be in our show notes. So please check out both these wonderful opportunities to get games to the table, have a lot of fun and support getting more people out there into gaming. All right, everyone. So that's what's happening with us. Anthony will be following up next week and he already has his Patreon episode, his top 100 deep dive will be coming out, wow. number 70 to 61, and my episode either this week or last week will pop up, which is my kick in the habit. I talk about 13 games on Kickstarter that you might want to check out, but now that we talked about all the fun stuff, <laughs> let's get into all the things that we want to do. Let's talk about our acquisition disorders. So Chris, what's on your radar for this week? Uh, so I've been waiting for the Metal Gear Solid board game to come out. Uh, this is a game that Simon has picked up. Uh, Emerson, uh, sorry, Emerson Matsushi. God, I can butcher his name, sorry. Uh, so he's the guy who designed Spectre Ops. Uh, he's got a huge love for the Metal Gear Solid game. And he's bringing it to the board games. Uh, it got dropped a couple of years ago. And then Simon just recently picked it up. So, being my favorite video game of all time, I'm really, really excited to be playing this. Excellent. Yeah, I remember that big announcement where they were just like, there's a crate. And you're like, oh, wait a minute, we know what a crate means. <laughs> <laughs> you can't fool us on that. Excellent. How about you, Dave? What do you have on your radar? Well, just as a little side note for Chris, just uh, you guys may not know, but I don't get a chance to go that often because I'm pretty busy. But I belong to a board game design group, Ooh. and Emerson Emerson is in the group. Oh, so yeah. he actually uh, told us a little bit about the game and stuff like that that's uh, coming out. So that was really cool. So yeah, he's uh, a, super excited about that. He's a local. I think he's in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, oh, he's a local. He? Long. I, I think yeah, if he's in Brooklyn or what? If he's in Brooklyn, he comes out. He drives pretty far to come see us. I thought he was more out on Long Island. I don't know where he lives, but. Um, <laughs> But it's nice he to listens. see him. He listens. So, know. hey, hey, Emerson, how you doing? Hey, yeah, yeah, how you doing? Yeah, I'll send him a link to the podcast. <laughs> Looking forward to your game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Chris from Board, uh, Board Games for the Better, we first purchased. There you go. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, but my acquisition disorder, uh, I have my own little Discord where all my friends, uh, you know, we, can, we, uh, we group together and talk about games we're playing and we set up our asynchronous games and, and stuff like that. And then somebody dropped a uh, link. And it said, uh, and we all said, nope, this is fake, it's fake, it's fake. <laughs> and, th and then, like, the next day, like, the official announcement came out about Twilight Imperium coming to board gamers and uh, board, board game, not no, 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 board game arena. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we were all like, okay, well, I guess we're all playing that. So because uh, we do, we have gotten together about once a year for about 12 or 14 hours and knocked out Twilight Imperium uh, 4. Wow. So now I guess we're going to play Asynchronous online as soon as as soon as soon uh, we get a chance to. Yeah, I saw that too. And it was like on the side of, it was like a, a panel at one of the booths at Essen. And they posted it and I was like, that can't be right. And <laughs> I, I haven't seen it in beta yet. Uh, we've been working with Board Game Arena. We had worked with Board Game Arena for a very long time and we always had asked for this because 
there are those epic, crunchy games that are so nearly impossible to get to the table, especially with all the setup and breakdown time, if they could have done this. And it seems like, in fact, they've done it. So it's going to get to the table or the tablet. You know, at PAX East last year, uh, they had a, uh, a Twilight Imperium tournament. I, I was like, who is going to sign up for that? And there, there was like 16, 20 people that signed up for that thing. That wow. must have taken weeks to finish. <laughs> 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 no, they did. I, I guess they did one game a day. Sure. I guess I, I don't know. I saw. I think it was a World Series of Board Games, the championship or something. They did Mega Civilization. Do either of you remember Mega Civilization? <laughs> yes, my friend has it, okay. and he, can't, he wants. He's asked us to get that to the table. We can't. We no, I remember. I remember looking at it online in the schedule, and I was like, "That's amazing!" And then they said, like. You are not allowed to sign up for the game unless you can answer X number of questions from watching like a nine hour instructional video. Wow. And then you have to commit to 18 hours. Chris, did, <laughs> yeah. Chris, this is what is it, Dave? Like, is it 19 people? Like, what's the max? It's like, it's a crazy. Uh, it's crazy. I think it's 18. 18. I think it's 18. 18 yeah. people playing a game. Civilization game, Chris. That's insane. You don't come back from that. You, no. you enjoy it. And it's over. Your life is over. That's it. I, You've seen, I just imagine you've somebody, seen too much. <laughs> I just imagine somebody <laughs> buying like a plane ticket to go cross country be like, this is my weekend. I'm so hyped for this. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those one, once in a lifetime games. It's like those yeah. legacy games out there where you just play once and you enjoy it and it's great. Uh, on my acquisition to story this week is an expansion that's currently on Kickstarter for a game that really surprised me because I'm not a horror movie fan, and I'm not an abstract fan. And then I got an opportunity to play a game from Smirk and Dagger called The Night Cage. Now, this is literally a black and white board game on the table, and you are represented by one of these candles that are traversing these dark, dark cavernous kind of extra-dimensional pathways, and you're just trying to get out. And your candle's the only thing that you have. The glow of the candle is what's protecting you from the monsters. And you're all of you are working together to get these keys to get to the gate and get out before you either get, I guess, eaten, <laughs> killed by these monsters, or you fall through and you run out of time. So that's the kind of basic premise of the game. And as you move, you keep laying out tiles. And as you keep laying out tiles, the light, the candles melt down. So there's a timer in the game as well. One of the interesting mechanics of the game is you can actually fall through the cavern down to like nothingness. But thankfully <laughs> with the game, it repositions you on one of the edges. So you're like, oh, well, that's horrifying that I fell down a dark cavern where there's monstrous creatures. And then somehow I popped up the other side. Jeez, I wonder what happened. Well, guess what? They made an expansion about what happens when you fall through this cavernous hole. Uh, <laughs> that is funny. And it's scarier. It's somehow scarier. And, like, it's not bloody. It's not gory. Families can play this. There's nothing terrible or rated R about it. But at the same time, it's got that kind of Edgar Allan Poe existential anxiety and fear kind of look to it. Well. The expansion gives you a sideboard, so when you fall through, you fall on the other side, and there's a giant, horrible, and I mean giant, as far as the board's concerned. And it's made out of boards. Nothing's nothing's miniatures here. And then basically what you do is you try to avoid the creature that's coming up and then get back to the surface, but now the creature's following you. So you're trying to do things to kind of stunt its progression. Eventually, the creature gets to the main board, and it's so huge hmm. that it eats up the board, like the whole board. So you have to rush to victory. I actually really enjoyed this game. Again, not an abstract person, not a horror person. Played this game, co-op. It is it is tense. It is a little scary. The, the tiles are kind of spooky. And yeah, it's a fun game. So it's currently on Kickstarter. Uh, you have only a couple of days to back this. The expansion's only $25. Bucks. Uh, Smirk and Dagger. There is uber level versions of this where like if you want the super deluxe version it's going to cost a lot of monies but i think even the base level is is excellent so the nut cage shrieking hollow whether you get on kickstarter or in retail 
um, something to check out. Great. I, it, some, of those, some of the things you're talking about, the big monster and stuff like that chasing you around the board just brought back Dwarf Fortress. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh, All right. Well, awesome. that's our acquisition stories for this week. Now on to our at the table. So, gentlemen, you got games to the table. Chris, what would you play this week? So, this week I uh, got to play Takedo Duo. Uh, I know last week you were talking about N- uh, Namaji. It was like the spiritual sequel to Takedo. So we ended up getting Takedo Duo to the table. Uh, so this is the two-player version of Takedo, uh, where you're not controlling just like one character like you normally do for the other two games. Uh, you both share in controlling three characters, the Pilgrim, the Merchant, and the Artist. Uh, each one scores in a different way, and you're kind of sharing and competing for the dice that you're drafting. So at the beginning of the turn, everybody rolls the three dice, and then... First player drafts one dice that controls one specific character. Somebody else con- drafts the second dice, controls the second character, and the first player takes the the final dice to control the third one. It might not always be what you get, but uh, it's really cool like way to twist a Kaido into this like kind of two player tug of war game. Um, I don't know if I like it as much as Takedo, especially because. Uh, like the scoring kind of feels a little bit samey over time because there's not really going to be too much wiggle room on what you can do. Uh, like the merchant will always score from uh, you know from selling the piece that he picks up, and whenever you get that dice, you know what you're doing with that dice, and then you only have so many options of where to move. Um, but I think it's still definitely a game worth playing. I don't know if it'd be worth buying. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I would definitely say if you have a, sh- a chance to, to play Takato Duo, go for it. So as far as Namiji, we talked about. Takaido, we talked about. Takaido has two expansions. They have the deluxe version. And then Duo, where does it fit amongst them? Like, is it, we're talking number three or number um, two? So I haven't played Nam- Namaji, but okay. it seems very similar to Takaido. Uh, sure. And everything that I like from Takaido kind of seems to be mirrored in that one. I would probably put this one on the bottom of the three. Okay. But the thing is that with it being like a duo version, I feel like there's sure. a lot of games that kind of fall in that area. And it's like, when I see it, would I want to play this over like Splendor Duel, over Hanamakoji, uh, over, you know, Shadows in Kyoto. Like there are other kind of two player tug of war feeling games that sure. I feel like are in this space that are, are really good. If you really like the theme of Takedo, if you really like those mechanics, and I mean, yeah, Takedo Duo will, it'll, you know, get you in all the right ways. But I feel like when it comes to compared to like its bigger brother, it's just better for it. This is more like an entry level kind of stripped down, tactical yeah. back and forth than the kind of la- lavish kind of production and like yeah. experience of going down the Takedo Road or circling the seas and things like that yeah the thing is that in Takaido, like you get that really satisfying like i blocked this spot you know you can't give money to the shrine i'm there i'm holding down the fort i'm sure. gonna take my sweet time moving down these spaces you know <laughs> holding you back you don't yeah. you don't get that on this and it's you feel like you're moving around the board and it's just kind of like well i want to go here oh but I, it's like i want to go to to the, see the mountains oh i want to see the the waterfall and you kind of keep tugging back and forth with that one pawn until one person gets what they want and then the other person stops caring about that character and becomes like the third dice you draft because nobody really wants it or (laughs) you really want to go to that one market but you rolled a two instead of a three this time so you can't make it to the market this time uh maybe next time i'll get it now next time i moved too much now i got the three i only needed the one i can't make it to where i want to go so like i feel like the decision space isn't really as fun as Takedo. Yeah, I think once you get a die to the situation of a game that's supposed to be very scenic and chill and just experiential, and now you have to, like, random, you can't do a thing. Random, you can't do a thing. Random, damn it, I can't do a thing. <laughs> All right, yeah. cool, play on that. I like that, though. I definitely want to check that out, because I think that, I haven't played it yet, and that would complete my Takedo collection of games, so to speak. <laughs> How about you, Dave? What did you play this week? So I played a bunch of stuff. I played D&D, Race for the Galaxy, Five Minute Dungeon, and Love Letter. 
but I am playing asynchronous online on a, uh, a website probably most people have not heard about because nobody plays this game, which is uh, a Civ role play. And uh, it is, talk about mega civilization, which we just had a conversation yeah. about. Uh, I am currently playing with six of my other friends, Advanced Civilization, that old game from Avalon Hill on this website. Mm. And uh, we are having a blast, plus chatting it up and smack talking on Discord just, you know, adds adds to the fun level. And uh, by the way, I just brought up uh, uh, the uh, uh, board game, um, sorry, uh, board game geek for that mega civilization game we talked about. It is 18. I just wanted to double check sure. 18 max players. But you need five as a minimum to even play. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like insane. But going back to Advanced Civilization, I, I had the original Civilization game by Avalon Hill back in high school. And then they came out with uh, the Advanced version. I've probably played it in person live six or seven times. This is now, I think, the third time we've played Asynchronous on, on uh, this website. And uh, one of the games... Now, when you end the game, you usually end the game with, like, uh, 5,000 points or whatever, right? Uh, uh, the last game that we played, I won by one point. It was unbelievable. One, I had one more gold coin than one of my friends. It was, it was a, a victory. I printed out the uh, score sheet, and I posted it on my wall in a frame. <laughs> wow. That's fantastic. But, but this, time, this time, I was winning all the first half of the game, and then... They're all like, nope, we can't let Dave win again. So everybody ganged up on me. So I'm in like third place right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's long. It's another very, very long game. I guess it takes about two months to play it asynchronous or more. Sure. But, uh, you know, good times. Okay. Having a good time. So definitely a play recommendation? Uh, a play recommendation or a buy since it's free on yeah. the website. <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's out of print. It's out of print. But you would have to have somebody probably teach you. It's it's uh, it, the rule book is it's going to be hard for someone just to jump into a game. If only there was a game master out there, Dave. I don't know. <laughs> That's me, <laughs> Game Master Dave. I'll teach you anything that I know. I don't I don't know every game. But... <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, those are. Oh oh oh, and uh, uh, I think if we uh, if we had it already, we would have all played uh, a Jedi, Ooh. right? Oh, I got yes. that. I, I I I cracked it open. I put it out. I was like, "This is awesome, amazing! I'm really excited." And then I put it back because I don't have three other people to play with it. So, and I was at a game store last night. I saw it on the shelf. Uh, I almost bought it for one of my birthday presents, and I put it back on the shelf because I said I don't think anybody's going to play it. Oh, and I I wanted it though. I was looking at it on Game Nerds, thinking like, "Oh, should I do this? Will it get played? Will it hit the table? Do I have three other people to play this with?" <laughs> well, now I have two other people to play this with. I just need one more. I think I can drag Anthony into it. I think we'll have four. So we'll have to set up a date because I really want to review this game. I've read so much about it. I backed it on Kickstarter. I was really excited about it because it seems like it's got that. And again, I, I don't want to say anything because I haven't played it yet, but it seemed like it had that TI4 quality as far as epic strategy is concerned and like interaction yes. is concerned. And that asymmetrical kind of like your faction plays different, period. And I love that. It's it's the holy grail because does it work? Can it be taught? Can enough people learn? Because because in those situations, it's not just can you learn your faction, but you have to learn enough about the other factions in order to yes. benefit. It's not a solo game. It really has high interactivity. And that's, I mean, that's what we all want, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. that's what we want. Yeah. It's, it's similar problems to getting root to the table, but now it's yes. it's more political root. <laughs> less it's, less fuzzy animals, more politics and government agendas. Yeah. Yep. I'm I'm excited. I'm excited to get to the table because if it if it does pan out, because I think for a lot of us too, except for Dave, who plays a thousand games a week and we're all jealous about that. Um <laughs> I would like to find a lifestyle game, more or less. I'd like to find a game where like that's my game. And that's a that's a hard one. So if it could be, that'd be amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it'll be a little bit before yeah. we get that on board game arena. So it's got to get to the table. Got to happen. Uh, what did happen was I did get to play Endless Winter Paleo Americans. 
Uh, this was a game that was on Kickstarter not too long ago. Got back to backers. This is from Fantasia Games. And it's an interesting game. It's a worker placement game that utilizes deck building and then has several other mechanics thrown in there just because they could. Uh, so we're going way back. We're going way back 10,000 BCE. And these nomadic hunter gatherers are dealing with um, the Ice Age and just struggling to survive. So you are one of these clan leaders, and you have a specific clan leader here. And your job is to obviously lead your clan to victory, prosperity, and of course, victory points. Because that's how civilizations work. It works by victory points, right. if you didn't know that. <laughs> so... I did not. I mean, really. I mean, we should all we should all be pretty clear on that. I remember seeing this on Kickstarter and just like reading through it and going, this is just too much. It's just too many different things. And it kind of is at the start because basically you have a lot of different sections that have a lot of different mechanics that kind of somewhat come together and kind of are just like ancillary kind of pieces. There are also a lot of different small expansions. We played with several of those, but there's many, many more that came along with the Kickstarter. And they're small. There are a couple of cards, there are a couple of miniatures, and things like that. Let me talk about just how to play the game, which is honestly very basic, and despite the look of the game, it's not that complicated. You start by playing your culture cards. At the beginning of the game, you have a hand of five cards, and there's five cards waiting for you because that's deck builders. And you'll get some random cards, and one of those cards could be culture cards. Culture cards are typically things that benefit your culture. And typically, they are represented somewhere else in the game board, but playing that card gives you a free action instead of taking that spot on the particular board. Uh, it could be uh, food, it could be weapons, it could be. A number of things I'll talk about in a second. Once you get past that section, and you'll get a lot of those cards later in the game in comparison to the beginning, is you do your worker placement thing, which it take your worker, or in this case, your chieftain or, or one of your tribes people, and then you place them on one of four available spots on the main board or a resting spot, which I'll talk about in a second, which connects to the eclipse phase of the game. Placing on the one of the sections lets you do one of these four main actions that are very important for your success because typically what it's going to come down to is scoring as many points as possible. It's not a point salad game, but it kind of somewhat feels like that. Um, one of the things you're going to do is you need food. But food is all these different animals out there, prehistoric animals and such, somewhat made up for the, you know, it's a little cartoony and made up for that kind of time and age. Uh, you, need to, you need to get creatures. If you eat them, you get food and other benefits. If you don't, you gain a set collection situation. All of those different animals are set collection scoring points. So don't eat the animals <laughs> for lots of reasons, obviously, because first be cool, but second, score points. Cool people score points. Uh, there's also an opportunity to build up your, your tribes. So actually building up tents and then upgrading those tents out there on the tundra and all these different spots, score you points. You also have the opportunity to pick up more culture cards, which I just talked about in a second. And then finally, gain up more powerful chieftains and warriors into your deck. Uh, again, benefiting your worker placement. So you take those different actions, you place your worker out there, and now you have to play cards to the board. Now, the cards are important because all the cards have labor on them. So it has this blue symbol that shows, like, this person's going to do the labor at that particular board. But each of the boards has, like, a one-time ability, uh, ability that lets you do it multiple times, and then some extra opportunities. And, of course, if you get there first, you get extra stuff. So you have to play as many cards as you need to be able to utilize that ability, and then some people have extra labor that they bring along. Once you play those cards out there, you'll be able to, with that labor and typically food or weapons, you'll be able to do the thing that you need to do on the board. So cards are essential for you to do the board actions throughout the game. As the game goes on, you'll collect more cards. You'll be able to do more things. That's awesome. 
once you place your three workers out there, whether they go out to the main board or they rest, then there is this eclipse phase. Basically, it's like the night phase. At that point, if you place a, rest, a resting worker, you get a couple bonuses, and you also get the opportunity to get some free labor. You take your cards that you have left in your hand. They give you labor plus any resting workers. That allows you to get an opportunity to have the most labor, and whoever has the most labor determines the player order. First, second, third, depending on the number of labor that each player has. Once you're able to do that, and you gain you know, the, that kind of ranking, you'll gain a special ability for that particular turn. Your cards might have Eclipse abilities, which gives you an extra bonus during that phase of the game. But again, you have to kind of figure out strategically, do I want to play my cards to the open actions or to the later actions, which will affect the player order? So there's some kind of negotiating as far as like, what do they have versus what do I have? Will I play a lot now? Will I play a lot later? You do this over four rounds. You pick up special bonuses that go on your player board to give you extra abilities as you reveal different tents um, and other areas. You'll gain points and special abilities throughout the game. As I mentioned, the game has a lot of different separate areas. So we talked about the worker placement. We talked about the deck building. There's also a resource kind of board where you're building up uh, with these tiles that you have. Those tiles give you extra uh, you know, bonuses and victory points in the game. There's also an, a, a, a temple track, which allows you to bury workers or bury cards. So it allows you to kind of like thin out your hand and put them in this tomb area. And that's good because you're going to have a lot of cards in your hand throughout the game. The cards also score points. See, as I mentioned, it's, it's a lot. But as you build up your tomb, you'll be able to score points at the end of the game. That that altar area where you're tombing all your people also allows you an opportunity to score additional points for leftover resources. So there are tracks. There is a landscape where you place, you know, buildings out there to score points and special resources. There's another area where you're scoring resources. There's the main board where you're taking actions. And of course your cards. And of course the animals score you additional points based upon set collection. Phew. It's a lot, and you're going to score a lot of points, and it's not going to feel like at any point you're in control of the game because you're not really in charge of the game. <laughs> you're just kind of rolling with it, but it's actually a lot of fun. So once we got past that first kind of clunky round, it played pretty smoothly, and at the end of the game, it was like, okay, we all did very well. Not sure how we did it, but we did things. We scored points. I scored a lot more points. I won the game. I don't know. I did a thing. It's good. Uh, I liked it. I liked it. Uh, it's a play. I'm not going to give it a buy because I think it was missing out on your tribe having more complexities and some asymmetrical player powers, which I believe is in some of the smaller expansions in the game. That being said, this also ha this game has a lot of cognitive load. Because you are managing like worker placement, deck building, placement on the. It's just, it's a lot. It's not bad. It's not too heavy. It's 100% manageable. I liked it. The artwork is great. The graphic design's fantastic. It's just a great production all throughout there. Just good, good, good stuff. But it does feel like a lot, especially at first. So, uh, Endless Winter, Paleo Americans gets a play for me. Well, I, I really appreciate you mentioning that because, like I said, when I was at the game store last night, I saw it on the shelf, and yes. I, 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 it was a possibility for me to buy. So I guess I'm going to have to come over and play uh, Hegemony <laughs> and Paleo over at your place, Chris. Oh, Absolutely, man, Paleo sounds like it's everything in the kitchen sink. Like they, they're just really trying to like pack as many mechanics in there, as many zones on a board. Oof. The artwork made me feel that the game was thematic and the production was great top notch but i never really felt connected to any of the actions in a meaningful way i always i always saw the mechanics on the surface it always was like oh this is thinning my deck oh this is area control this is this and this is that like i never got into like like you didn't have to feed your people you didn't have to save enough food for your your tribe 
which seems to be like the essential quality of that kind of, I don't know, quasi civilization builder, right? Like I don't have to, I don't have to feed my people. I don't have to protect them or anything like that. They're like, nah, they're fine. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. But again, <laughs> I guess they don't want to be Agricola. So yeah. like, to each you can own. feed your family in different games. Not in this That's game. right. <laughs> They're fine. They're fine. Use your use your food to uh, do actions. Like, all right. I guess I guess that's a thing. I, I'm playing uh, Feast for Odin right now, and I, I'm trying to figure this game out and uh, figure out the feeding of the people there too. So, nope. See, <laughs> if Anthony was on, he would tell you how much he loves that game. Not a fan. Like, I get it. I don't understand. Like, again, it's just that's another game where like it's a great game. I played it multiple times, but like. The fact that your food is all different shapes on the board, it just takes me out of the game. I'm just like, oh, you want to feed your Vikings that round? Cool. You know, take a take an apple pie that's shaped like a trapezoid for some reason. I'm like, <laughs> sure, why not? That's that's definitely the shape of apple pies. I don't know. I don't, I'm just making this stuff up. But I remember, and then again, it's fiddly as heck because pieces. So if you're playing that online, that's the way to play that game. I'm playing it online. Nice. And they're going to come up with a new version of it. I think like a refreshed. I don't know if it's going to be radically different, but it's going to be somewhat different. So maybe that'll be better. Maybe that'll quell my oddly shaped food concerns. I watched a, I watched a play how a learn how to play video of it uh, for feast for feast for uh, feast of Odin, uh, yeah. and uh, I think about four times during the video they said. Don't be intimidated by the action card. <laughs> yes, there's 75 actions you could do, but oh, you, you could just just choose something and do something. I it's a weird like... game because you, in order to win the game, you have to take negative tiles, and that's weird. But I get it. That's very Uwe Rosenberg, though, to do yes. like, like the negative points and all that. But I feel like every time I hear like S over seventy actions, and I'm like, <laughs> all right, well, at what point does this become an action selection game and not a worker placement game? Yeah, you're just yeah. like, like, oh, I can't take that one action. I'll just go next door and I'll grab the next one. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. All right, well, that was the games that hit our table this week. Now on to our feature review. So our feature review this week is Chris's feature review from Board Games for the Better. Chris is going to take us through his. Top 10 games. All right, Chris, this is up to you. Take us through your list. Well, actually, what, before you take us through your list, how did you come up with this list? You play a lot of games. Yeah. And you were able to whittle it down to 10 without going insane. How did that happen? How did you um, do that? Well, some of these games are very much like I have a type. Some Similar oh. to how um, Metal Gear Solid, like, it comes from a video game. Like, I played video games before I got into board games, and certain themes just kind of really translate into these games really well. Uh, so a couple of them are like that. Uh, some of them are, like, very unique designs or themes that you don't kind of see very often that I just, like, I see it, I go, ooh, that's so cool, I want to play it. Um, and also, I do, I played a lot of Magic before I got more into just, like, uh, board games over the, like, you know, TCG games. Uh, so like lots of you know, card games, deck building games that really just kind of like, they scratched that magic itch when that game got too expensive for me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you survived the CCG. Oh, barely. <laughs> <laughs> now, now Pokemon is trying to drag me back in. <laughs> no, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> and stay away from Lorcana. That's, that's going to do it to you. Ah, that's going to end no. you completely. See, for, for me, it's like Pokemon drags me in because my nephews are getting into Pokemon and they oh, always no. bring their cards around. And I was like, you know, I could toss a deck together for like 30 bucks. Let me <laughs> let me deck tech a little bit. And then, like, you know, fast forward 20 minutes and I'm playing on my phone. I'm like, all right, I don't like this deck. Let's try something new. <laughs> oh, man. I, I recently uh, finished reading uh, The Silmalarian and Lord of the Rings to Ginger. So we had to get the uh, Lord of the Rings uh, magic decks. So, Oh, yes. Dave, you should have done it earlier. You could have got the million dollar card. I, yeah, I know. We, uh, somebody got it by the time we bought it. But that's okay. Yeah, uh, that was now they have Now they have all of the Doctor Who sets that are coming out. And immediately I'm like, oh, I need to start rewatching this. Like sometimes just... Magic just really knows how to grab you. <laughs> Ginger just started watching Doctor Who, uh, and uh, she's really enjoying it. And then I told her this Commander Magic sets for Doctor Who, and she's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Almost got her next time. <laughs> Almost got her. 
Yeah, my uh, my niece yesterday was walking around with Pokemon cards, and she's like, "Oh, I got Pokemon cards!" And like, she's like, kind of somewhat curling, folding. I was just like, I started to feel it in my bones. I was like tensing up. I was like, <laughs> "Ah, she might have an expensive card. It's a rare card." It's, it, <laughs> no, no, no. It's, I'm sure it's nothing. I'm sure it's nothing. She's like, you want to look at them? I'm like, no, I don't <laughs> want to know that you just destroyed like a hundred thousand dollar card. No, no, no. I you don't need to see that. Charizard. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so my bro- my oldest brother donated to me his baseball card collection. And then me and my friend decided to have card wars. And for, oh. like, for like a week and a half, we were like pegging each other behind hiding behind chairs and everything like that. And uh, unfortunately, I have like a Don Mattingly rookie card that's like oh, destroyed. Man. Oh, <laughs> that's evil, man. You never know what you have until it gets thrown into a chair. <laughs> <laughs> or into a when wall. I, when I or was a kid, wall. when I was a kid and we had baseball cards, the game, one of the games that we used to play, which was, again, probably sponsored by the Topps baseball card company because they wanted us to destroy the cards, was you flick the cards to try to get closest to the wall. Mm-hmm. And then obviously they bound you destroy the edges of the cards, and let's not talk any more about that. That's a thing I did. Let's just say that. <laughs> let's just say that and never yeah. mention it again on the podcast, okay? Because I can't can't do that again. So cool, Chris. Let's go back to a board game top ten because I don't want to think yes. about all the millions of dollars I lost in cards. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm gonna start. Number ten is Potion Explosion. Yep. Oh yeah! So uh, this game really just draws me because the tactile of playing with all these marbles—it's just—it's a reason for adults to play with marbles. Uh, So in this game, you have about these like six tracks where you're rolling marbles down. Uh, They line up in all different colors, and whenever you—it's your turn—you pick one marble off from any of these tracks, and if two of the same color marbles touch. They explode, you get them, it combos, and you keep going until no more combos. Um, so if this is like if you wanted to get like Candy Crush into a board game, uh, it's really what it feels like. It's marbles mashing into each other and more combos and more combos. And as soon as uh, you get all your marbles, you have these little flasks that you're trying to like slot them into to meet certain recipes. And if you fill up your uh, your flask, you get the flask's ability. And this is where the game kind of like really takes off. Uh, every flask has a different power. Uh, the harder it is, the more points it's worth. And something I really like in this game is that you don't lose points for using these crazy powers. Uh, like the game encourages you to like build up like two, three flasks and have like wild turns where you're drawing like 12 marbles at a time to fill up more flasks, to use more crazy abilities. And it's just a really fun like loop when you're playing this game. Um, and then like I do have a couple of the expansions that kind of like adds more craziness to it. Uh, but one rule I just really, really love, and you don't need the expansions. It comes with it, but you don't need it, uh, is if a marble ever touches the table and it falls off your hands, Minus two points. You get a punishment oh. token. Yeah, oh, no. and, it's, and it's a silly <laughs> rule that I, when I first time I read it, I was like, that seems weird. And then we played with it because, yeah, you know, you're playing with it. You're getting like 12, 14 marbles sometimes. You're really comboing. And then you like, that one marble rolls off. You hear the clink and the table gets silent. You go, oh no. And someone just slides that punishment minus two points towards you. You're like, ah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's that, it's a really cool game. Uh, there's not much interaction when it comes to like hate drafting because you do get a lot of options on the board to like where to pluck your marbles from. Uh, but you could always steal marbles from opponents with certain flasks, or you know they really need a red, you know like, like four reds, and you have a one flash that can burn all four reds away for them. So you can kind of like go, you, you kind of like poke at other players like that. But there's not too much interaction aside from it. Yeah, I've had, I've had a lot of good luck playing this game with non-gamers. Not like gateway gamers, but like non-gamers. Because like you said, Chris, they understand that Candy Crush situation. So they're able mm-hmm. to kind of manipulate the marbles rather easy. And then just putting them on the flasks is not difficult. They get a little challenge, which like what flasks to pick so that they yeah. can combo that stuff. But that could be learned a little bit later. later. Uh, so yeah, no, I had a lot of fun with that as well. Dave, have you played it? No, uh, oh. this is this is you know I like to call myself Game Master Day, but let me tell you there are some big gaps in my game knowledge. I'm actually more impressed with uh, Chris from Board Gamers Anonymous because you guys talk about a different board game every week. It's oh like yeah, crazy. 
So we have I, a problem. I, we have a serious I, problem. We need help. <laughs> I thought I knew a lot of games, but uh, you got uh, Chris definitely uh, knows so many more. But anyway, uh, no, I haven't played Potion Explosion. Now it's uh, a lot of fun, and I, I like the ghostly expansion, the ectoplasm. Yeah, because then it gives you that wild that you can kind of play with. But uh, so now it's, it's a really great game, cool. Chris. Is the terrible the to other... transport though? Oh, it's really, and it's also terrible to play at nighttime because if you have neighbors, you drop the marbles onto this plastic uh, like railway system that it has to like line up all the marbles, and it's so loud. And like and the people who live upstairs from us, every time we play it, and it's like ten o'clock, you hear go 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 go, and we're like, oh my god, you got to be kidding me! <laughs> <laughs> all right, so Chris, you're number nine. So number nine is Quacks of Quedlinburg, uh, and this is specifically with both expansions sure. uh and i normally don't always say like you know, like you have to play with the expansion you have to play it but for this one i i really did not like quacks quedlinburg base game by itself i felt like uh you would kind of like you know well the game is about as a bag builder i don't know if either you've played it but like you have these like uh you know seven eight ingredients that are in front of you uh you buy them at the end of every round to add to your bag and you're trying to kind of push your luck to see how far you can go in your cauldron until you blow up. And when you first play the base game, uh, I feel like your options are really limited. You like you find that one really good ingredient where it's like, pull this and jump forward like four spaces, or pull this and get free victory points. And you're like, well, these two seem really good, or this one seems really good. And you just kind of keep buying the same ingredient over and over. And for me, the game felt very boring. Then came the first expansion. And it added uh, an ingredient called loco weed, and it was just like enough fun, more randomness that kind of interacted with the other ingredients a bit more. Cool, great. Now they added a little uh, cup at the end, so if you got to the end of your cauldron, you can keep pulling more ingredients. Great. It adds. It, it makes the end game more interesting. Um, I was like, cool. Now this game is getting more interesting. Now I want to play it more. And then came the alchemist expansion, and this is where the game really kind of like popped off for me really made it like oh I love playing this and what it does is that it incentivizes you to buy different different colored ingredients uh and the more ingredients you buy the more you pull and you put into your cauldron you get these little points where everybody gets like an asymmetric power and you get to use your power and this is kind of where the game really like shines at its best for me and i know it's like a lot to add into a game it's a lot to ask people to buy too to be like get the base game get the the two expansions i've got the geek up bits you know like <laughs> it's a lot but for it's it's my wife's like one of her favorite games i really like playing with it and it's just it's crazy where it's like how like that one little like mechanic to incentivize you to diversify your build really just kind of makes the game shine because then you're really playing with a bunch of fun powers you're hoping you draw you know that like yellow token that you know eliminates your white uh token so you can kind of keep pushing further and further um but yeah like quacks like it's a roller coaster you there's not much more decision making than what you're gonna buy you just want to keep pulling out of the bag and you're just kind of it's just you kind of go along with the ride for the game it's great yeah, it's uh, it's. I got the chance to play this before it was published, and I was like, "This, this is huge," mm -hmm. and because you, at the time you didn't get a lot of those press your luck games, and that's what this really is because yeah. you're putting the the stuff into the cauldron to you know to make this potion, and I know I don't want to say it's potion explosion, but it's kind of potion explosion, right? It's a little. It is. <laughs> Whereas uh, potion explosion, you get to choose like what you're blowing up, and like yes. this is this more you don't want to like, blow up. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to blow up. Um, and it's just like really fun. Just like sometimes you just get really bad pulls. I, there have been games where it's like you know the second to last round, and yeah. I keep drawing like white token, white token, white token. I explode, and I look yes, at like how could this happen? You start counting tokens like yes. that was impossible, and yep. then other people will just run away with the game, but. Uh, they have a really cool cap catch up mechanic with the rat tails. So the further yeah. behind you are, the further ahead in the cauldron you start off. So you Absolutely. always kind of feel like you're in the game, even when you've like had a, a bad round or two. You're always like, "No, I, I'm in this. I, I'm still in it." And they balance that out really well. And I think the popularity is is really apparent with the geek bits because basically oh, yes. it's almost as much as the base game to buy the upgraded pieces. Yeah. So yeah, for, for me, there. like I, I'm a sucker for deluxe components and stuff like that. It's 
Uh, it's, it's, that's what gets me all the time. <laughs> gotcha. All right, number eight. So number eight is a game called Glow. Uh, not many people really talk too much about this game, and it's crazy to me. So first, just art style wise, it is uh, like very Tim Burton style, black and white, uh, like Disney creatures, where it's like you have these like um, like foxes that are like out of like a children's horror like movie. It's the really really cool design. Um, the Art style is really just kind of pops out at you because it's all black and white with like intense splashes of color. Um, the card quality of it is something that just, I have to bring up. They have like spot UV cards that really make the characters pop, the back of the cards pop. Um, and But what this game is, it's a card drafting tableau building game uh, that has like sort of dice drafting as well into it. It's a very weird mix. So what happens is you... Uh, lay out five uh, creatures in front of you and on your turn you draft one of the creatures and the creatures come with specific dice attached to them and you roll your dice and you see if you trigger any abilities on your card on the these creature cards that you keep drafting each round and you're trying to kind of like combo them together so you have a card that says like for every two of a kind you get three points and then this one says for every fire you get to move one you know you get to yeah. an extra uh point you get it to like get an extra friend you know to move along the way yeah it's beautiful and it's it's a really interesting artwork it really so is unique. like yeah you you don't see this kind of style but it's like i like that it's like uh like childishly horror because like true. The, the things that like, you have a lot of uh, a lot of friends that you pick up from these cards where it's like if you like roll two water symbols your your friend goes away he goes to the graveyard like you've lost him on your like journey throughout the game so it's like it still like moves along this like horror theme that i really really like and it kind of it kind of played it's a better version of machikaro i think where yeah, you're getting yeah. cards and you're rolling dice. So yeah. I re- appreciate that as well. And then uh, what's really cool is there's a board that you move along. So depending on what you roll, you get to like keep moving forward. The further you get into the board, the more points you get. And then on the other side of the board, there's a uh, different version where it's archipelago and you're like moving ships to different islands. And the board changing changes like what you want to draft. Um, it changes how you want to kind of approach the game entirely because one is about what symbols you do and don't have, and the other one is like well, you need three, uh, three of the same, or you need two different, and then you can get access to different islands. So yeah, no, it's definitely a cool game worth checking out. Uh, it's called Glow. Yeah, awesome. Excellent. All right, number seven. Oof, wait. Number seven is Clinic Deluxe Edition. Uh-oh. So this is this is easily like the heaviest game that's on here. Uh, so the best way I'd like to describe this is it is food chain magnate for doctors. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, everybody is trying to build and run their own clinic. And uh, you're doing this by action selection. You have a couple different actions you can take every turn. You have a higher build. Um, you're trying to like essentially kind of make the most lucrative clinic. Um, so what's really fun about this is that the theme, even though it's medical themed, it's very much a satire. So it doesn't matter how good you are at treating your patients. It's more about how much money is each patient, patient giving you, uh, you know, do you want to take a patient on, but kind of let him sit in the waiting room until he gets a little sicker so you can pay you more money. Sounds like a good plan to me. Um, that's crazy. You know, do you want to give that patient uh, a room with a view and make him like sit next to a park because he'll pay you double if you do that, <laughs> uh, or he'll feel a little bit safer if you put a fire hydrant right, uh, a fire extinguisher right next to his door. He'll pay you just a smidge more, and then like you get to keep adding these like little modules that gonna get sillier and sillier. And uh, what's what's funny is like the game at one point just becomes more about uh managing your parking lot so you can get more patients to come in and you're just like i want to be able to like get more parking spaces so i can hire more doctors so i can get more patients and it's it's a really fun and silly theme um but like one thing i really do like about it is like you make all this money at the end of the round you have to choose with this money do you buy victory points or do you use this money to build your hospital and as soon as you decide not to buy victory points 
the money goes into like your your bank account essentially it's not money in hand anymore yeah. you can never go back on that decision so if you've made 50 bucks and you want to go and buy you know three victory points with it great whatever you decided to keep that's only going to be used to build up your hospital or hire new staff and you have to pay all your staff and all your staff need parking spots and there's a lot of mechanics to it uh there's a lot to keep track of especially when it comes to building your your hospital because certain rooms can't be adjacent to other rooms. And so you have to always be mindful of that, that adjacency. But now this adjacency also goes for floors above and below you. So you can't oh, build boy. it. You know, you can't build a service room above another service room or next to another service room. And it can't be next to where, you know, your surgical suite is. And you need to make sure your exits and entrances, like, you know, your patients aren't running around wasting time. Your doctors need to have efficient movement. There's so much to keep track of. But, like, the theme is just so so satisfying. And, and you, so you say you like this game, obviously. Ah, uh, it's so much fun. It's this really <laughs> cool mix of like spatial puzzle and like it's just like it's a fun thing to to do. Like especially like there's one module that you can throw in where it's like zombies and you're trying to prevent like zombies spreading from your hospital. And you don't want zombies because zombies don't drive. So the cars start piling up in your parking lot and then you don't have enough space for new patients. And it's like, it's, it gets really silly. Um, and but then you have other ones where it's like, um, you know, your surgical suite, they can take care of any patient you want. You pay a little extra money and you can just be like, cool. I had somebody from cardio that came in, send them to the surgical suite, take care of them in two seconds, pay a couple extra bucks, get that parking spot cleared. <laughs> Was this originally a video game? No, so this was uh, oh, wow. an old version of a game just called Clinic. Yeah, uh, that got re kind of like remade into Deluxe. Clinic Deluxe. Yeah, yeah. Albin VR, his wife works in the medical system back in their country, and when you play the game, like you said, Chris, you want to heal as many people as possible because you do want to <laughs> heal as many people as possible and make as many points as possible, and then. Slowly, you realize the the more you allow patients to get worse, mm -hmm. the more extreme treatment they need, and therefore they'll pay more. And you're like, dear God, he's put it in the game. It's in the <laughs> game. He knows. Yeah. And then this is like talking the quiet part out loud. Yes. <laughs> I, and, and Chris, I own all the expansions. Oh, and same. I, and I, I can't nice. wait. The the new one is is coming out later on I this year. And I'm, and he's like. This is the finale, and it's like, ah, oh, perfect. Oh, way to finish it. <laughs> he, and he and Dave, he even did a COVID-19 expansion during yes. COVID-19. Oh I was oh on Kickstarter, gosh. and he donated the money towards the COVID-19 work that was helping, I'm sure, underprivileged populations out there. And it was a co-op version of the game. Yeah. The man's a genius. It's, it's yeah. a scary well, genius. <laughs> well, it's for a good cause, but that might have been too soon. Yes. <laughs> All but right. but it, it was, I love that he turned the COVID expansion, it, making this game cooperative, was just yeah. like a really nice touch to it. And he's got a really unique approach to game design. Like, between, like, this and Small City Deluxe, like, yes. his, his approach to game design, like, it, they really do feel different. And that's why it's on its list, is because when you play Clinic Deluxe, it doesn't feel like anything else that you're playing. 100%. Alright, Chris, number six. All right, so this is a game called Human Punishment Social what? Deduction 2.0. <laughs> so, uh, theme-wise, it is a uh, like cyberpunk future uh, theme. Uh, clearly, social deduction. Um, so, this is a game by uh, Got Up Games, and this is the reason it's on its list is that it has made some of the best gaming moments at the table. Um, so in this game, you have multiple factions that you can play as, uh, you get randomly dealt an ID and loyalty cards, very similar to other social deduction games. And each, uh, faction behaves very differently. Uh, so you have the humans, they want to work together. They have very cooperative abilities. You have the machines where they have very aggressive abilities. Um, and then you start to get a little weird and then you have the fallen. So these are zombies. And the zombies are at players that might have been eliminated, and then they come back, and they come back as a separate faction. Now that all the zombies are grouping up together, you have to fight them off. Um, you have the Legion, which is like this faction that kind of sort of spreads like a virus. 
And at first it's like, and you never know who's Legion. They can they can spread unknowingly. And after a certain point, it almost becomes like a cult. Everybody wants to become Legion. And you're trying to sniff out who the Legion players are so you can become part of their team. Um, and then you have the Outlaws, which are the ones that want to win by themselves. They don't have any allegiance. They want to just kind of play this like very crazy social game until they can swing the game into their favor and become the last man standing. And the abilities that you get in this game are crazy. Most definitely not balanced. Um, the uh, These power cards that you can draw are also very silly. Some of them are, eh, skip a turn, whatever. Uh, some of them are, you know, take a gun out of somebody else's hand. Or change the target of, with that someone's picking. Or, you know, make everybody discard all their cards. Or place their cards face up. You get these, like, very crazy, wild, swingy abilities. Um, but it's just, there's something about it. I wish this game would get a, like, uh, revised version. Like, for them to kind of, like, go in and do a once-over to clean it up. But, like, man, this game just has, like, so many fun moments of just, like, you, you, someone picks up a gun and points it, and then immediately, suspicion, he's a machine, he's a human. And you start to slowly, like, sniff out, like, who's on your team. And then at the very end, when someone dies, they do the check to see, you know, what team is winning. Um, and then when you finally get that moment where, like, somebody calls it, like, game, you know, machines have won, all humans are gone. And it's like, ah, oh, ah, oh, we killed the wrong guy at the wrong time. It's, it's really cool. It's, it's a social deduction game that's definitely not for everybody. It's a little bit heavier than most, but really, really cool experience. Uh, board game, uh, board game, um, board game geek has it rated at 7.5. That's a great score. Yeah. And it says it says fifteen to ninety minutes and four to four to sixteen players, so it could be a fifteen minute game. Yeah, so it's definitely going to be shorter. Sometimes because like the the roles and the teams get randomly distributed. There's sometimes where it's like you know one or two human players, and if they get eliminated early on, you know that's the end of it. Um, wow! But like the bigger the game, uh, the more interesting the game becomes, especially because uh, after a certain point, I think it's past eight players you start sharing loyalty cards with the players to your left and right. And so some people on the table already have information on you. You already know parts of them. So like you kind of look at the person next to you and be like, you machine, we machines, we're doing this, we got this. And you kind of like <laughs> do a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But then his ID says always human on it. And then he doesn't get that twist until later on. And he's like, oh my God, I trusted you all game. You're, you're like, it's, it's a really cool way to approach like, those like higher player counts. Nice. All right, number five. All right, so number five is a game that's not really available around anymore. Um, this is where the like video game board game starts to cross over a bit more for me. So this is the Resident Evil deck building game. Uh, it was a game I started playing very early on into getting to board games. Uh, I love Resident Evil. I love the horror theme. And uh, with this, what I found out later on is that this game is very similar to Dominion. Uh, it is a deck building game where you have the open shop exactly like how you do in Dominion. It's as customizable as Dominion. Um, but everybody has their own character card that has an ability. And all these are all the characters that you know and love from every Resident Evil game. And ability-wise, it is very thematic. Uh, you know, like characters that are known for their, uh, you know, like hand cannons, like they have abilities that are geared towards it. Is this guy better, you know, notorious for his knives and bows? His ability is geared towards it. So you always kind of feel like you're playing that character. Uh, and in this game, what you're trying to do is there is a mansion. And it's just a huge stack of cards with a bunch of different enemies in it. And you're trying to fight the final boss and be the one that defeats him. And whoever has the most points in the game wins. And you never know what you're going to flip on the top of the mansion. And that's kind of where the, like, the scary horror part comes in. Because you can go in with, you know, a gun and a knife and think you're going to, like, fight something easy, flip a mini boss, you're like, ah, okay, you know, got to heal, got to lick my wounds, got to heal up, got to come back stronger. Uh, sometimes you might go in with, you know, two knives, a machine gun, and half, you know, you know a belt of grenades, and then you flip a chicken. <laughs> and it's just like, you flip, like, this, like, sad little monster that just so happened to be walking by, and it's just like, and then you feel safe. And then you, you kind of go in a few more times, and then the, the mansion hits you back. You're like, ah, okay, got to lick my wounds, got to go back again. So it's a, it's a very fun uh, loop of, like, you're pushing your luck with how much, you know, uh, power you want to go in. 
and then like as the game goes on you get the, these abilities that make you feel more you know specialized in certain ways and it's just a really fun game to like it's a nice twist on dominion now that i've played it excellent number four uh so number four is even more crossover with video games so this is the not just one game specifically, but it's a system. It is the Exceed fighting game system from Level 99 Games. So this is their take, and Level 99 does a great job at like implementing board games and video games crossing over. So this is their fighting game. Uh, you have Street Fighter characters. You have uh, Guilty Gear characters coming pretty soon. You have uh, Blaz Blue and Undernight, all these really great anime fighters and just fighting games in general. It is a two-player battler uh, where you have that like two-dimensional fighting. Uh, you have different spaces. You're zoning. You've got your footsies, your grapplers, your zoners. You have all these things that I know and love from fighting games, from playing them for so many years. Uh, it just comes through so well in this game. They've really done a great job. And you can see there's a lot of love and care into making sure that they, like, whenever you pick Ryu, you feel like you're playing Ryu. If you want to pick up Zangief and play that big bulky grappler that's slow, like you'll get that feeling. And there's so much uh, like counterplay, and like the more you get into your character, the more you're familiar you get with him, the better you can play as him. And it's like I really do do feel like I'm playing my fighting games on on the table. It's it's a great translation of it. Excellent. Yeah, I, I have a bunch of the Street Fighter stuff myself. Yeah, it's it's really cool, and like uh, a lot of the mechanics that they have with like uh, like how you can boost your attacks to kind of like prepare for a bigger and better swing, and uh, like sometimes if you just kind of get mixed up, you can just like top deck as a scramble, like just to kind of simulate that like more button mashy for a moment, like you know just to kind of get out of a bad situation. Like they they've really thought of a lot of really good things in this game. All right, that leads us to number three. All right, so this is another game that's not really that available, uh, but they have a different version of it. So this is Legend Legendary Encounters Alien. Uh, so the, uh, they have a few different versions of Legendary Encounters. There's Alien, there's Predator, there's uh, Firefly, X-Files, and I think they just did a Matrix version that just came out. So some of these are available still, some of them aren't. I particularly love the Aliens uh, version of it. So this is from the Aliens movies. Uh, and you have all your favorite characters from every single movie, and it is your classic deck building game, but this is a full cooperative game, and what really just makes this game shine is that it is such a mean game. Uh, you never feel safe. Uh, you know, chances are you're all not making it out to the end of the game. People will die. Uh, you know, <laughs> someone will have a chest burster that comes out and instantly kills them, but like the there's a moment where like you get that chest burster and you know it's in your deck and if you draw it you in you'll instantly die then you just look at your teammates you're like i'll take the hits i'll go in i'll go crazy <laughs> because you know your time is limited yeah. and it's this very fun feeling where it's like you know if you die i went out swinging i went out guns blazing and <laughs> um and also like the game the way the game works is that you're trying to get to the end of these three missions at the end of sure. the, the third mission there's usually a big boss you're trying to you know get together and fight uh but like the missions never really give you guidance it just kind of says like close the airlock and then everyone looks at the table like how do we close the airlock and like, i don't know and you have to kind of like work through the enemy's deck until it's like, oh, here's the controls. Okay, we have to get the controls. We have to go to this location. And now we have to make sure this location is clear and get this card to there. And then pay, you know, some of our like power and currency to like activate and turn the power on. And now we got the airlock. Great, guys. We did it awesome. And then you flip mission two and it says, cool, move the deck, uh, the enemy deck one space closer now because the airlock is closed. So they can't go there. So it's like, okay, now like the pressure feels it's like it's more on and the enemies start piling up and then you're all trying to work together and you have cards that can like add more buying power or more combat for your friends so you're like oh my god i'm too short can i can someone give me more power and someone's like i got a cooperation card and they play it and you're like yes we finally pulled it together it's like it's this very fun cooperative experience it's just like you it's just you always feel like you're on your toes and i cannot i think i've only ever survived like one or two games We've won here and there, and we've lost plenty too. But I feel like most of the times, like I always end up dying at the very end, heroically, clearly. But it's just, you know, it's just really fun to be able to go in, go crazy at the very end if you know your your time is done. Like, 
It's fun. Yeah, out of all the legendaries, and there's a lot, this yeah. has always been my favorite. I think this plays so thematically well, as you explained, Chris. I think, again, there's a lot of legendaries. Everyone loves them. They're endless, endless kind of versions of them and ways to play it. This is the best. I, I just, I'm going to say it. It's just, yeah. it's fantastic. I, I just tracked down the Predator version, so now I want to be able to mix them together and play Alien versus Predator. <laughs> nice. All right. That's our number three. Number two. Uh, so number two is Race for the Galaxy. Uh, and the reason this is so high on the list is because Race for the Galaxy, I believe it is the perfect deck of cards. Uh, the 52 card deck had its time to shine for many, many yeah. years, but I think Tom Lehman really got it with Race for the Galaxy. I think it's beautifully balanced. I think you have so many routes to victory, and there's so much fun gameplay. It's, for two players, absolutely amazing. Me and my wife play it. It's it's so good. And then it just scales up to so, to four players even better. Um, you have so many times where you're thinking, like, what are they going to play? Can I take advantage of anything they're going to activate? And you just want to try to kind of, like, get that one leg up on other people. You see somebody's playing a lot of blue planets, or they're really gearing towards one specific strategy, and you get a card that takes advantage of their uh, strategy. And there's just a lot of really fun, quick gameplay. The game sets up quickly, it breaks down quickly, it's no fuss, no nothing, you just, it's it's clean. It's just the only way to explain it. Such a clean, clean game. I love fantastic. I love the frustration yeah. level where you have to spend the cards that you you know you, you're you're thinking about a combo, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. but you have to discard that card right now in order to buy another planet. It's just. It but you know what? I I love that because then you don't get attached to them. That's it. You have that one or two cards in your hand. Like those are it. That's the gold. You've told yourself like that alien planet. It's gonna win me the game. I'll toss my whole hand out. <laughs> And I feel like they, they, it's a really cool system of just like, yeah, toss cards out, draw more later, keep building up. And like, there's also a jump drive, <clears throat> which is like yeah. the little brother to Race for the Galaxy that takes that specific feeling and just cranks it all the way up to 10. And it's just like, you're just playing cards, tossing them out to play bigger cards. And all of a sudden you realize, I'm drawing 24 cards. This is great. And you, you're just tossing out more cards to play more cards. And it's it's a faster, looser ver version of Race for the Galaxy. But I like how Race always feels like there there's you want to go more trade routes, you can do that. You want to go more aliens or more genes or more you know mining. There, every strategy always seems viable. And I feel like that's something that not a lot of games pull off really well. Race for the Galaxy really pulls that off. Have you played Roll? Roll for the Galaxy. Oh, I, I love Roll. So Roll, I feel like, plays better the bigger player counts. Sure. Uh, Race, I feel like, shines the best at two. Uh, and then there's New Frontiers, where it's like that mix of like uh, Race and Roll, but it's like kind of, it's mostly Puerto Rico in the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, but I'm a huge fan of that whole series. It's easily one of my favorite ones to go back to, Same. especially on a board game arena. Yeah. Just quick games here and there, especially for Jump Drive 2. Quick games take you five minutes to play. Excellent. All right, Chris, that leaves us to your number one. So number one, easily by far, is Spirit Island. So... Uh, Full cooperative game, which I've learned I've started to like more and more throughout the years. At first, I really wasn't a big fan of them, but Spirit Island kind of really won me over on all of them. Um, the theme comes through first and foremost in the components. You, it is a settler destruction game, uh, which is great. You know, finally there's a game where you can kind of kick settlers out where they don't belong, um, and you're playing as the spirits. All the settlers come in these like ugly white plastic on these like beautiful wooden boards and wooden components. And you just see them on the board and you just know they don't belong there. They they just like they don't match anything else in the theme. Meanwhile, the natives of the island are in these like beautiful wooden little huts that they give you. Uh your player pieces all wooden, all cards, all cardboard. And I love how he kind of pushes that theme through just through the components alone. Uh, you know that like when the invaders go and they attack your land and they, you know, they make a mess out of it, they drop these little bubbly plastic tokens on it on your beautiful little wooden island. And you know that like you, this, this shouldn't be here. 
Um, so I just love how he kind of came across that in the very beginning, like when he was making the game. Uh, and then you're playing as these spirits. There's a bunch of them to choose from, and each and every single one truly changes the game. Uh, there are certain spirits that will come from the ocean to drown invaders, but they can't do anything about the lands that are in the middle of the island. And so you just have to accept the fact that like that area is gone. You can't reach it. You need your friends to help you reach that area. Um, some of them play as giant mountains that explode and erupt, and they damage the island themselves, but they also scare the invaders away even more. And it's like there's so many really cool uh, approaches to how your spirits play. And I think there are like two or three expansions in now. They keep finding ways to kind of stretch the mechanics of the games to like really become more and more thematic. Now that they've kind of designed more and more, you have all different kinds. There's a there's a spirit for every play style. Uh, aggressive, supportive, destructive. Uh, you know, there's some spirits that just focus. They don't care about getting the, the invaders out. They just want to like rejuvenate the island and make it more inhabitable. And they start making more and more natives or they make it harder for the invaders to get deeper into the island. It's just an absolutely amazing experience. Yeah, this has been this for one year. This was my number one game of the year of all time in my top 100. And it's always floated in their top five because the asymmetrical plane of each different god plus the combination of other gods at the table is just next level. Like, I have never seen that in a game where, like, your character really plays like your character, but also the other characters in combination with your character have to truly cooperative, cooperate in order to even come close to winning. And then the thematics of the colonizers coming in there and disrupting and the native people, the Dahan, pushing back. It's just, it's such an interesting dynamic. And the, the fact that the powers, the spirit powers, depending on what spirit you pick, you could pick something less complex and still be an extremely valuable member of the team. It doesn't diminish the gameplay to have something that's not overly complicated, but it's fun. It's just straight out fun. Yeah, and I love that. Like the more you play the game, the better you get at it. You uh, it gets a certain point. You're like, oh, you know what? It's too easy. And then it's like, great, perfect. We have adversaries. We have scenarios. You can add multiple adversaries. Adversaries have ten different levels to them, and so there's always like a bigger difficulty to push. There's always this like you can always keep moving the goalpost for yourself if you really want a more challenging experience, a deeper experience. You know, it, the game plays great solo. It plays great with two, three, four players. Like, the more spirits you add, yes, the complexity and the time definitely go up for sure. But if you're willing to kind of put that in, then you just get this really cool experience where you get these crazy combos and different mechanics meshing together. And it's it's really good. You can see they put a lot of time into seeing how they balance with each other and with the adversaries and with the scenarios. Excellent. I'm, I'm guessing uh, both of you had rated a buy. Oh, absolutely. Oh, it's, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, it's... And again, you could get this in a lot of different versions. There's... I would say, Chris, the one thing is there's way too many expansions. Like, um, it's it's painful, the number of expansions that are out there for it. But but the, the thing is that only one of them feels like you need it. I feel like Branch sure. and Claw adds the, like, the event system into yeah. it, and it adds that little bit of kind of randomness which normally i wouldn't want in a game like this but the randomness makes the island feel like alive it feels like it's reacting to what you do and you get it gives you more choices to make but like if you don't want all of that you could just buy horizons of spirit island and That's you get it. this like family weight version where it's just entry level spirits no events no nothing and you just sure. gotta get the base game and it gives you one adversary if you kind of want to push the the difficulty up a little bit and that's fine for a, a bunch of people like that that is more than enough game to go back to time and time again and i think it's like 30 bucks at target now now for new yeah, it's, I, it's for new players no, I, I agree i think i think that's that's the best version for people to start with what i'm kind of commenting on very similar to clinic is that there's so many expansions that it's hard to know how to find the ideal play situation and then mm -hmm. the invaders have a lot of different versions of them you can play with so yeah. that could completely be a lifestyle game and like you could buy that and buy as much of it as possible 
and never need another game because it's just that good. But for yeah. people playing the game, if you don't, if you there's other combinations of spirits to, that do make the game challenging, which is not yeah. bad. But what's a good experience at the table? Uh, would you say though that the base game is still awesome by itself? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would say if you were to buy just the base game on its own, it gives you more than enough uh, gameplay. You get plenty of spirits with a bunch of different play styles. Uh, you have enough adversaries to be able to push the difficulty if you really want to. You can keep things simple by just playing easy, the easier spirits it comes with. And the deck of powers that you're pulling from is a really decent size. And so you're never going to really have the same game twice because you can play the same spirits you know time and time again but the cards that you're pulling the powers that you're getting will always be different and it's always going to influence the way that you're going to approach the game and the invaders where they come in and what locations they attack is also randomized from this like very very little deck that you're pulling from and so it's never going to be the same order that they're going to be attacking you take a card out of like every phase of their attack and so you never know that I take out the mountain card this time. Maybe you took out all the mountain cards this time without even realizing it. And you're putting all this effort into defending the mountains. And you won't see it till the end of the game. Like, you know, there's so much change that can happen in the game. And you can never even change your character. And it would be the completely different experience every time. Excellent. Now, fantastic game. Um, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Game Master Dave. Uh, again, all of the sh- all of the information about the two upcoming mini cons are in the show notes. Uh, thank you all for your support. Thank you all for supporting your local conventions, your local game masters, your local game stores. It's a lot of work to put these things together. I can't begin to tell you how much work. So please support because these kind of events and conventions does support the community. Uh, obviously, Chris's great organization with Board Games for the Better. Check it out. They're always doing great things. You can get all that information and much more. If you want to learn about Dave's top 10, uh, check episode 412. That's to right. Get his top top 10. And if you want to hear a little bit more from Chris and Dave themselves and that gaming convention that we love in Long Island, New York, check out episode 416. Uh, we'll have Chris and Dave back again. Uh, we have upcoming conventions. And again, Chris, thank you so much. Dave, no, thank you again. Me. Thank you. Great time. And until next time, this is Chris. And this is Chris. And this is Dave. And we'll save you all a seat at the table. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. See you.